My name is Darren Nattinger. I work at NI and today I'm going to be presenting on how to increase the performance of your VIs. Throughout my presentation, if you have any questions, raise your hand. Somebody's going to bring you a mic and uh, you can ask the question and I will do my best to answer it. I've been working at NI for over 25 years. Most of that time I worked in LabVIEW R&D. Um, and over the course of that time, I have given a lot of presentations. Uh, I've presented at NI Weeks and NI Connects in the past. A uh, show of hands, who's here for their first NI Connect? That is great. I'm so glad to see you guys. I'm hoping to make your time worth your while over the next hour. Okay, so like I mentioned, I present on LabVIEW a lot. In fact, I present on LabVIEW so much, I have a website where I list all of my LabVIEW presentations. So if you go to dnat.org, you can download all of my presentations, slides, demos, video recordings of them. In fact, this presentation I'm giving right now has been recorded. If there was something else on the schedule you would rather see and you wanna watch this one later, leave. You, you won't hurt my feelings. But if you stick around, I promise uh, we'll have a good time. So yeah, dnat.org is where you can get all my stuff. This particular presentation is at bit.ly.slovis. And uh, down in the bottom corner there, you see I've got a download link for Zoomit because during my presentation, I'm gonna be doing a lot of stuff like annotating the screen. Uh, and the tool that I'm using for that is a tool called Zoomit. If you ever give a presentation for the rest of your life, download and use Zoomit during that presentation because it will really augment the material that you're sharing because you can call out things on the screen, you can zoom in on things. And uh, you'll see me doing that multiple times during the presentation. So I've got a very detailed outline about what I'm going to talk about. I'm gonna talk about why I'm talking. I'm gonna talk about stuff I'm not gonna talk about. Then I'm gonna talk about stuff that I am gonna talk about. Then I'm gonna do demos of the stuff I just talked about, all right? There is my detailed outline for y'all, okay? So first of all, why am I talking about this stuff? Why am I giving this presentation today? I would venture to say that about once a month, Somebody comes up to me, uh, sometimes it's an NI employee, sometimes it's someone else who says, hey, I have a VI that is too slow. I need your help to get it to run faster. And the slow VIs can be in a variety of application types. You'll see that when I demo some later, but it's almost always, I've got a big chunk of data. I'm trying to do something with it and it's taking too long. That's almost every single time there's a performance issue that somebody comes to me in LabVIEW, that is the case. Big chunk of data taking too long to process. And over the years, I've accumulated a toolbox of ways to help solve these problems. And it turns out a lot of these tools and techniques are very simple and very general purpose. And so that's why I'm sharing them with you today. No matter what type of application you're working on in LabVIEW, if you've got a big chunk of data and you're processing it too slowly, the techniques that I'm showing in this presentation today should help you with that. All right, so there are a lot of tools and a lot of techniques available to solve performance issues in LabVIEW, and several of them I'm just not gonna discuss in this presentation today. Uh, for example, the Desktop Execution Trace Toolkit. It's a very useful tool in LabVIEW for tracking down performance issues. It also has a pretty steep learning curve. And in this presentation, I'm trying to stick to simple general purpose stuff. So I'm not gonna talk about Desktop Trace Toolkit today. There's a tool in LabVIEW called Show Buffer Allocations where you can see dots appear on your block diagram where buffers are allocated. I'm not gonna talk about the, that today. There's another tool called Profile Buffer Allocations which has an annoyingly similar name to Show Buffer Allocations. Probably the coolest LabVIEW feature you've never heard of. Um, well, I, I'll, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it later but technically I'm not gonna talk about it that much. Um, I've already given a presentation on benchmarking techniques. It's part of a presentation I give called an end to brainless LabVIEW programming. And the link for the download is there on the slide. I'm also not gonna talk about how the compiler works. There's a couple of pages on ni.com that are excellent white papers that describe how the LabVIEW compiler works. So I'm not gonna go into those details today. And I am not an RT guy and I'm not an FPGA guy. So all the stuff that I'm talking about today is um, mainly going to apply to LabVIEW on the desktop. Although I'm guessing, again, since these are general purpose techniques, if you've got a large array in your RTVI, some of these techniques might help you in processing that faster. So what I am going to talk about is the VI Profiler. The VI Profiler is the easiest tool in, to use in LabVIEW to track down performance issues. And there's some good, bad, and ugly things about the VI Profiler that I'm gonna cover today. Another thing I'm gonna talk about is VI settings. So there are certain settings on a VI that you can enable and disable to improve the performance of the VI. 
I'm going to talk about parallel for loops, which is one of the easiest ways to speed up your slow VIs. And then I'm going to talk about certain patterns that you can employ when you're programming your VIs in terms of you know, how you construct your block diagram to improve performance. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about sets and maps, which if you're not familiar, is a new data or new data type that was added about five years ago to LabVIEW that uh, in a lot of cases can be a more efficient way to process a large section of data if you're doing lookups than uh, arrays. After I bore you guys with the slides, hopefully not too boring, I actually have some real world demos that I'm going to show you. So actual slow VIs that people came to me with that I was able to speed up with some of the techniques described in this presentation. So uh, there is one disclaimer, though, before we move on. Sometimes there are some really silly things that we have to do in LabVIEW to get our VIs to run faster. If your number one goal is maintainability and readability of your VIs, which that should be your goal most of the time, you shouldn't have to do the things that are in this presentation. But if performance is your number one goal, if you have a VI that is just not running fast enough for the requirements of your application, sometimes you have to do some silly things in your VIs to make them run faster. Whenever I cover one of those items in this presentation, it's gonna have an exclamation mark next to it. So as we go through the slides and you see something with an exclamation mark, I'm gonna call that out as, I know you guys, this is silly, but this is a thing that can sometimes help to figure out or to fix those slow VIs. There's a famous quote, make it work, make it right, make it fast, and you do those things in that order. So notice the most important thing is to make your code work the next most important thing is to have it be designed correctly. And the next most important thing is to make sure that it's fast. A lot of times you don't need that last part. A lot of times you don't care about performance because it's not something that is going to relate to the you know, requirements of the application. You've got a very UI heavy application. You don't need to optimize like processing a small array in the code when someone's clicking on things. That doesn't matter. Uh, but sometimes the speed does matter. And that's when we're, the things that we're talking about in the presentation today. And after you have made it work and made it right and made it fast, hopefully you have written some unit tests or something to make sure that it still works because there's nothing worse than optimizing code that ends up not working after you optimized it. All right, so the, the main thing that I want y'all to get out of this presentation, by the way, is if you find the VI profiler intimidating or if you have never used the VI profiler, I hope that after my presentation, you will realize there's nothing to be scared about. It is a super easy tool to use to benchmark code. So when I say the VI profiler, I'm referring to the profile performance and memory feature in LabVIEW, which is in the tools profile menu. So if you've never used it, that's where it is. This is the tool that I'm talking about. This is not some add-on, this is part of LabVIEW. It's been around in LabVIEW for, I shouldn't say literally forever, but it feels like forever because I managed to get LabVIEW 3.0 running on a virtual machine and it had the VI profiler in it. And I don't even know how old, I think I was in elementary school when LabVIEW 3.0 came out. So it's been around for a long, long time. And the, the purpose of this tool is that you can run the VI profiler to get information on the execution time of your code and also the memory usage of your code. Spoiler alert, we're gonna be focusing mainly on the execution time part of the VI profiler. Now, okay, here is how you use the VI profiler. The first step is to launch it. The second step is to check the timing statistics checkbox in the upper left corner. The third step is to click the start button at the bottom. The fourth step is to click the run arrow on your VI. The fifth step is to click the snapshot button and then you look at the results. That is it. That is all you have to do to utilize this feature. I'm gonna be showing this in some of my demos later, but there is nothing to be scared of. This is a super easy tool to use to profile your code and figure out how to make it faster. So what are some good things about the profiler? Well, hopefully I just convinced you with those six simple steps, it is very low barrier to entry uh, compared to a tool like the Desktop Execution Trace Toolkit, which takes a while to figure out how to use effectively. It's also very easy to interpret the results that are displayed in the profiler because you can check the uh, timing statistics button. Uh, you've got the VI time column that you see there and your VIs are automatically sorted by that. So as soon as you click snapshot, you can see which VIs took the longest when you ran your VI. And whenever you get the, uh, whenever you check that checkbox I was talking about, you get this column on the right here, which is number of runs. So that can be really useful to determine if uh, some of the VI settings you can apply would make sense. Later on, I'm gonna talk about inlining. If you've never heard of inlining, 
It's a way to improve per, uh, performance of LiveView by eliminating, eliminating sub-VI call overhead. Well, it makes sense to inline VIs that run a bunch of times. So if in the number of run columns, you see a VI that runs four times, doesn't matter, you don't need to inline that. If you see a VI that runs 9,400 times, like you can see in the slide here, might make sense to inline those VIs. A couple bad things about the profiler. It is a C-based feature in LabVIEW. There's a lot of parts of LabVIEW that are written in LabVIEW, which is great for people like us because we can extend those features of LabVIEW that are written in LabVIEW. The profiler is not written with LabVIEW, and so there's no way for us to extend it right now. Maybe there will be in the future, but there's not right now. Another bad thing about the profiler is that, remember I just mentioned, you can mark VIs as inline to improve performance. Well, as soon as you do that, they disappear from the profiler. So that's another bad thing. And in my opinion, this, this window has a lot of distracting info. This is what it looks like when you use it. These are really the only things you care about. The VI name, how long it ran, and how many times it ran. So if you, if you don't know what to look for, you can see you, you might, there may, might be a lot of distracting info that can take you away from what you're trying to figure out. But hopefully I've illustrated here, these are the things that you want to pay attention to. All right, a couple of ugly things about the profiler. The absolute time values that you see in the time column can often be unexpected. For example, let's say you have a VI that you profile it and it, the total VI time that it shows is 10 seconds. But if you're using a stopwatch and you started it when the VI ran and you stopped it when the VI stopped, your stopwatch might say 10 seconds or it might say 20 seconds or it might say five seconds. The VI profiler will sometimes show you a time that doesn't match what the absolute time is. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is that if there are parallel things happening in your VI, the total execution time of all of the parallel things will be added together. So you might have two while loops and they run in parallel and the VI finishes in one second, but the profiler says two seconds because it's counting up the time of both while loops. And then there's also this concept of LabVIEW friendly sleep time. That's a term that I learned from my former colleagues in LabVIEW R&D which is there are functions in LabVIEW where if they take an amount of time, that time is not included in a profile session. For example, the wait primitive. If you use the wait function and tell the VI to wait for a second, the profiler does not include that one second whenever it's profiling. But then there are things that might behave in a similar way, like you might make a call to a DLL and that DLL might take one second to run. Well, LabVIEW doesn't consider that friendly sleep time, so it's gonna include that one second. So two things that take a second, one is gonna show up in the profiler as one second, and the other one's gonna show up as zero seconds. So that's another reason. So all of this to say, I'm not saying we shouldn't use the tool, I'm just saying we should use the tool correctly, which is to look at the VI time that's listed in the profiler as a relative value. Don't try to, use, don't try to apply any sort of absolute meaning to those numbers. You see a number in there and it's big, don't really, you don't really care what its value is, you just see that it's big and you wanna make it go down. So as you start employing techniques that I show in this presentation, as, if that number goes down, then your VI is gonna be speeding up even if the absolute values aren't exactly uh, you know, real life. So the profiler that I've been talking about that I'm gonna demonstrate later also gives memory statistics. So if you are working in a situation where you, it's not necessarily the execution time that is causing you an issue, but it's the memory usage that's causing you an issue, you might think you might wanna use the profiler, which again is the tool that we see on the right here in the slide. But you see I've got the red slash through it because the profiler is not the best tool in LabVIEW for doing memory analysis. The best tool in LabVIEW for doing memory analysis is the profile buffer allocations tool, which is shown on the left side of the slide. Now, at the beginning, I said this was one of the things I wasn't gonna talk about. I lied, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. The reason I'm gonna mention it is because, like I said, it might be the coolest feature in LabVIEW you've never heard of. It's a way to identify memory issues in your VIs, but what makes it cool is that when you configure it to tell you about memory allocations that are over a certain size, and the profile buffer allocations tool returns information about those allocations, you can double click on items in the profile buffer allocations tool and it will take you to the actual node on your block diagram that is making that large allocation. That is much easier than the general information that the profiler gives you that says, hey, this one VI, it's using up this much memory. Well, what part of the VI is using up that much memory? It doesn't tell you, but the profile buffer allocations tool does. 
So that's why I wanted to mention it quickly. This is the only time I'm gonna talk about memory stuff in the presentation, but I, I just wanted to point out, you may have never heard of this tool. It's been in LiveView for several years. I suggest taking a look at the profile buffer allocations tool whenever you need to look into memory issues. So getting back to the profiler, here is the first exclamation mark of my presentation. So the first silly thing that I've had to do to try to solve uh, performance issues in my VIs. And that is, you've got a VI and the profiler comes back and it tells you that that VI takes a lot of time to execute. But you look at that block diagram and there's, there's no sub VIs on that block diagram. So th this is as granular as the profiler will get to share with you information. How can you get more granular than that block diagram? Just start picking parts of the diagram and turning them into sub VIs. Just edit, create sub VI, edit, create sub VI. It may seem silly, but when you do that, it's gonna take that one VI that takes a lot of time and split it up into different items in the profiler. And then you can identify, oh, this temporary sub VI I just made, that's making a lot of allocations. Let me focus on whatever code was in there. And then since we have undo, we can just press control Z, control Z, control Z, and the sub VIs go away and we get back to our main diagram. So it, it's a little bit silly, but it is a way to narrow down further on a block diagram the issues or the performance issues that might be happening. So one thing that you need to watch out for though is something called a subarray. So this is a topic that, uh, or this is a, a little feature of LabVIEW that maybe you haven't heard of, but if you look at the context help window that I'm showing there, you can see that when I'm hovering over that 2D array on the block diagram, the one that the arrow is pointing to, you can see that the context help, it doesn't say that that's a 2D array, it says that's a 2D sub array. So uh, again, I mentioned earlier, I wasn't gonna talk about the LiveView compiler. Okay, I'm gonna talk about it for a little bit here. So the LiveView compiler is an amazing piece of technology, let me just say. One of the things that's amazing about it is that we almost never need to think about it. That's one of the things that makes it so amazing. Well, the LiveView compiler does a whole lot of things to try to optimize the execution and the memory usage of your block diagrams. And I've been talking about memory usage and execution time as two separate things, but a lot of the times they're related because in LabVIEW, if LabVIEW has to allocate a large chunk of memory, that takes time. So a lot of the times performance issues in LabVIEW aren't necessarily due to the execution of something, but they're due to the LabVIEW memory manager having to take time to allocate memory for something. And so there's a lot of optimizations in the compiler that help you or help us have code that operates as efficiently as possible and subarrays are one of those things. So what's happening in this code here is that we have the 2D array coming in and it looks like we're taking a subset of that array and then transposing it. Now, normally, if you had a 2D array and you wanted to take a subset and do stuff with that subset, you would expect LabVIEW would need to make a copy of that subset, right? It would, you know, you've got your 2D array, we're, we wanna take this little chunk and we wanna do some stuff with it. We probably need to make a copy of that data so we can do stuff to it, right? Well, LabVIEW is looking at this code and the compiler figures out, hey, wait a second, I can just remember which part of that array they wanted to look at and wait, they're transposing it. Well, those are the same values. It's just uh, you know, returned in a different way. So I don't think I need to make a copy of that either. I can just, and this is the LiveView compiler. I'm, I'm speaking for it, I'm anthropomorphizing it, but the LiveView compiler is basically saying, I'm just gonna remember that on the block diagram, you want this little piece of the array and you want it transposed, but I'm not actually gonna make a copy of that. I'm just gonna remember that's the information that you need. And when the compiler does that, that's what a subarray is. That's basically the LiveView compiler saying, I'm not gonna make a new array. I'm just gonna remember this piece of this other array that you wanna do stuff with. Now, if after that transpose, we did something like uh, put it into a for loop and add a number to every value in the, in the array. Well, at that point, we do need to make a copy because now we're modifying the data that, that was in that subarray. But uh, all this to say, my silly trick that I list on this slide uh, doesn't work once you, uh, doesn't, uh, subarrays go away. So subarrays, if you have a, uh, an array on a block diagram and you pass that into, if you have a subarray on a block diagram and you pass that into a sub VI, the subarray goes away and LiveView makes a copy. So I actually had a situation where I recommended this benchmarking technique to one of my colleagues. And he said, oh, thanks for showing me that. Uh, you know, this, I figured out that this sub VI or the code that was made in this temporary sub VI, that's what's slowing down. And then I spoke to one of my colleagues in LiveView R&D about the same issue and he's like, 
well, no, it, that, that, that sub VI is slow because we had a subarray and we lost it. So that, that's why I say watch out for subarrays when you use this technique, because it might, if, particularly if you're doing, dealing with arrays, it might point you to the wrong place in your code where your performance issue is. So as you're highlighting code, edit create sub VI, highlighting code, edit create sub VI, before you do that, hover your mouse over wires and see if any of them say subarray, because if they do, you might actually be figuring out the wrong part of your code that is taking too long to execute. So, sorry I went on a little tangent there, but I hope that was useful information for y'all. Hopefully, uh, this, this concept of a subarray was, was new to some of y'all and uh, provided something uh, that you could learn today. So, uh, VI settings. What are some ways that we can configure our VIs to run faster? Uh, first of all, inlining. So, I mentioned that before. If you've never heard of inlining before, it's basically a way to tell the LabVIEW compiler whenever you encounter this, whenever you're compiling my VI, and there's a sub VI here, if that sub VI is marked as inline, which is a setting in the VI properties, pretend there's no sub VI layer. In other words, bring the contents of that sub VI block diagram onto the, the, VI, the calling VI's diagram when you call it. And this is a way to optimize your code. Uh, whenever you remove a sub VI boundary, there's a lot of optimizations the compiler can do. So what you'll typically wanna do is Relatively small VIs that run a lot, and remember you can use the profiler to figure out which VIs in your code run a lot. It's a relatively small VI that runs a lot. It's probably a really good candidate for inlining. Now, uh, speaking to my colleagues in R&D, they told me that whenever you are looking for optimization settings on VIs, you should really focus on the inline setting if you can, which means you're usually not going to mess with the priority and execution, setting, uh, execution system settings, those uh, two rings on the right side in the execution properties. I'll say I have been able to optimize code with those settings a handful of times, but it's almost always better to start with inlining if you can. That's gonna be the easiest way to improve the performance of your VIs. Here's another exclamation mark item. There are a lot of VIs in VILib that ships with LabVIEW. So, you know, all the VIs that you find in the palettes and you know, the stuff that's part of LabVIEW, uh, tens of thousands of VIs in VILib. Well, uh, unfortunately, LabVIEW R&D has not exactly applied the most optimal VI settings to a lot of those, a lot of the times. And what you'll end up finding is sometimes there's a VI that you've determined through the profile and our other tools that that VI is the bottleneck in your code and that's an NIVI, that's a VI that ships with LabVIEW. It's super frustrating when that happens. Um, but what you can do is you can save a copy of that VI and change the settings on it to make it more optimal. And when you do that, please give that copy a different icon. Give it a big red background color or something so that it's very obvious when somebody looks at your code that this is a copy of a VILib VI and not the actual VILib VI. Uh, one area where, where I've done this a number of times is the picture control VIs. So if you've got a front panel that has a picture control, there's a lot of VIs that ship with LabVIEW that let you do things like draw text in the picture and change colors and whatnot. Those VIs unfortunately do not have optimal settings. So I, I have saved my own copies of the picture VIs in LabVIEW a lot to give them settings like inline and stuff to make them more performant. All right, so this, when you change settings on VIs, when should you apply them? Well, remember earlier I said that inline VIs don't show up in the VI profiler? That means you should probably make inlining about the last thing that you do after you've benchmarked your code, because if a VI is inline and it doesn't show up in the profiler, it's gonna be really hard to figure out if that inline VI is part of your performance issue. So after you've finished profiling your code, mark VIs as inline to get that last speed boost. Also, Debugging settings, so the checkbox in the VI settings to turn on debugging so that you can do things like set probes and set breakpoints and use execution highlighting. It turns out that in order to have a debuggable VI, there are all sorts of hooks that the LabVIEW editor needs into your VI. And if you turn off debugging, those hooks are removed and your code's gonna run a lot faster. So if you're running VIs in the LabVIEW editor and you want to make them faster, turning off debugging is a super easy way to do that. Now. Uh, hopefully it's relatively obvious, but when you build an EXE, that code uh, debugging is not there. there. There's no block diagrams. So this suggestion applies to running VIs in the editor because there's no debugging in an EXE unless you build a, a de debuggable EXE. All right, so parallel for loops, moving on. Parallel for loops are the number one easiest way to speed up slow code, assuming there is a for loop in your slow code. 
It's the first thing I look for when I get a slow VI from somebody. The first thing I look for is, well, let me turn on parallelization on this for loop and see if it works. If you've never heard of or never used parallel for loops, it's just a for loop. You right click on its border and choose configure iteration parallelism and you see this dialogue here. And this is a way to tell LabVIEW that you want to take the iterations of that for loop and instead of running them serially, you want the LabVIEW compiler to split that for loop up into groups that can all run in parallel. When you configure for loop iteration parallelism, you get a little P in the corner of your for loop and that lets you know. I see a question back there. Can somebody bring a mic over? Yeah, to execute something like that, do you need to have like GPU processing or something like that or can that just? So the question is like what, like hardware, like what, what hardware is required to do something like this? At this point, all of us are running multi-core machines. And so the, th this, this does not involve GPUs. This is just the multi-core on your, on your regular computer. And uh, yeah, if your computer has eight cores, 16 cores, 24, what, however many it is, we can utilize as many of those as you want, which I'm gonna cover in the next slide. Now, sometimes you can't use a parallel for loop. So, um, but when the times that you can, a lot of the times there are nested for loops in your code. With rare exception, if you have a for loop that contains a for loop and you know, the nesting goes however, however deep it is, you almost always just wanna stick with parallelizing the outermost for loop. And the reason is, is the LabVIEW compiler has to do some work to set up those parallel instances. So imagine a case where you've got a for loop and then a for loop inside of it. The outer for loop is configured for parallel. The inner for loop is configured for parallel. The outer loop for loop splits itself out into multiple instances. Then the first thing it sees inside of this it's itself is a for loop that it needs to split out into multiple instances. So it does that, runs those instances, and it has to compile the data back together. Then the next iteration of the outer for loop runs, and once again, it has to set up those parallel instances. So whenever you have a parallel for loop inside another parallel for loop, the setup and teardown of the parallel instances often ends up slowing down your code more than if you had just let the interior for loop run in a serial manner. Uh, notice that I say in the slide, this is with rare exception. Uh, one of the demos I'm gonna show later, we actually have something that breaks the rule I just told you. So, uh, but usually you just wanna parallelize the outermost one. Just try setting the for loop to parallel. If your VI breaks, that tells you, oh, I can't make my for loop parallel and you can set it back to regular. The most common reason you can't make a for loop parallel is if you're using shift registers to share data between the iterations of the for loop, we can't split that out because the values inside of one iteration depend on the values on the previous and so we, we can't do that. But if your for loop doesn't have that, then we can, we can parallelize it usually. This slide is uh, a lot. This slide we could spend the rest of the time talking about. I'm going to ask that if you have questions about this slide, you come up to me afterwards because I don't want us to get bogged down. But a lot of the stuff that you see here is not intuitive. So I wanted to spell it out. I wanted it to be in the slide so when people download the slides later or watch the recording later, they can pause and sort of absorb all this stuff. So when you configure a parallel for, parallel for loop, we show the little P in the corner to show you that it is set up for parallel execution. You can actually wire a number to that P and tell it how many instances you want LabVIEW to run. Don't ever wire that, just leave it unwired. You'll notice that the dialogue that comes up uh, has the number of instances that you wanna generate. And you can see that it says eight. Most of the time on most machines, that's gonna say eight. You might see a different number on different machines, but most of the time it says eight. Just leave that alone. LiveVR R&D figured out that's a good number. Uh, even if you have a bunch of other cores, that's a good number. Just leave it at eight. In fact, uh, when I discussed this content with LabVIEW R&D, one of the guys that invented the parallel for loop just like screamed out, just use eight, like in the conversation, just to get everybody to shut up. So let's listen to Steve and just use eight. So, uh, but I will point out that some, some people will sometimes ask me the question, why not just crank that number up to the max? Like I think the most LabVIEW lets you put in that number is 64. Why not just crank that up to a 64? That number in that dialogue tells LabVIEW how many parallel instances of the for loop to generate at compile time. So if you tell LabVIEW you want 64 instances generated at compile time, you have just radically increased the complexity of the generated code for your VI. And if your machine only has eight cores, that's completely worthless. Um, also, if your for loop, just to get a little technical here, if your for loop has uh, reentrant VIs on its block diagram, LabVIEW is then gonna have to spin up a whole bunch of uh, multiple instances of that reentrant VI 
that aren't ever even going to be used if your machine only has eight cores. So I have encountered exactly one real world scenario where a team was doing incredibly intensive image processing in LabVIEW and they knew that their machine had 16 cores and they knew they wanted all of those cores processing those images. So they changed that number to 16 and I said, okay, that makes sense. That's okay, you can do that. But the vast majority of the time, just use eight. Please don't talk to me about this right now. We can talk about it after the presentation. All right, so let's get into ways that you can construct your block diagrams to be more performant. So patterns, programming patterns that you can do. The first one that's the easiest one is that when you have a sub VI, uh, and so it's got inputs and outputs, right? On the block diagram of that sub VI, always make sure the controls and indicator terminals are on the top level diagram of the sub VI's block diagram. This is every time I've talked to LabVIEW R&D about performance, this is the number one thing they say, the compiler has so many optimizations it can employ if there's not conditional calling of control and indicator terminals on a sub VI's block diagram. So when you write your sub VI's, just make sure the control and indicator terminals are always on the top level diagram. Remove decision points from your diagrams if you can. If there's case structure, the most common one is an error case structure around the contents of a block diagram to run nothing if no error happens. That decision point almost always doesn't need to be there. Your code's almost always gonna run just fine if the error just gets passed through all the things on the block diagram. And that's a decision point you can remove from the diagram. So look for ways you can remove those decision points. Again, we're optimizing the behavior of the compiler if we don't have to make decision points on a block diagram. Here's another exclamation mark. If you're doing string processing, a lot of the times the raw string functions like string subset, match pattern, those kind of things, end up being more performant than some of the newer string parsing functions. Like if you're you know, flattening from, or unflattening from JSON or flattening to XML, it turns out that if you process the JSON or XML with the raw string primitives, you can sometimes get a performance boost. Your code's gonna be a lot more fragile, but it will run a little bit faster. I'm actually gonna demonstrate this one in one of my demos later. And then if you program with LabVIEW classes, sometimes class accessors, whether they are accessor sub VIs or property nodes, uh, if they're inside of tight loops, those can cause performance issues. And sometimes it makes more sense to pull the raw data out of the class outside of the loop. So like, you know, numerics and strings and the basic data types of LabVIEW, pull those out of the class outside the loop so that inside the loop, you're only processing regular, uh, normal, primitive data types of LabVIEW instead of class data. All right, uh, if you are working with clusters and arrays and you are doing something like, I guess the simplest example is you wanna pull an array element out, add one to it, and then stick the array element back in the array in the same spot. Always use the in-place element structure whenever you need to modify a value inside of an array or cluster. If you don't, you can just use regular unbundle by name or replace array or bundle by name, replace array element. But whatever you do, if you have an array and you wanna change something, don't delete the thing out of the array, change it and then re-add it back into the array. I, I see that pattern way more often than I should. And I'm actually gonna show that in one of my demos as well. Now, if you've got a very large array wire, and when I say large, I mean there's a lot of data in the array, and this is being passed around and possibly edited in a lot of places in your code, you may need a DVR, a data value reference. If you've never heard of that, it is a way to take a large chunk of data and create a reference to that data and pass the reference around in your code. So this one gigabyte array of numerics stays over here and you can go read it and maybe modify values to it as references in your code elsewhere. So you don't have to make copies or pass a giant array around in your code. I don't like DVRs. They can tend to cause deadlocks and issues and they make code less readable in my opinion. But sometimes you have to use them. Sometimes, you know, if you, you know, you're using a functional global that passes around a giant array, that can be a performance issue. But in my opinion, DVR should be a last resort whenever you're looking for ways to speed up your code. All right, sets and maps. Instead of good, better, best, I have good, gooder, bet, better, better, best, for bits, if whatever. Uh, just read the slide. Um, so search 1D array uh, is probably the easy, normal way that you would find something in an array. LabVIEW has a malleable, malleable VI called search unsorted 1D array that does the same thing, but you can actually pass in a search algorithm to it in case you know of a way to find things faster. Then you can also do a binary search. If you have sorted data, then you can probably find things in that sorted array faster uh, if it's sorted. 
And we have a malleable VI that will allow you to, again, provide your own algorithm. And then if you've never heard of variant attributes, uh, I'm gonna talk about them briefly, but it is a way, a long time way in LabVIEW to create uh, key value pair lookups. It, it wasn't intended to be that, but it is that, and people have used it for that for many years. But uh, as of LabVIEW 2019, actual legit data types for lookups were added to LabVIEW called sets and maps. And uh, it turns out sets and maps can solve some performance issues that might be present in some of those previous approaches. So the primary performance benefit of a map, and if you've never seen one, don't worry, I'm gonna demonstrate them here in a little bit, is that they eliminate the data type conversion that's required whenever you're storing uh, key value pairs in something like a variant attribute table. So again, if you've never heard of variant attributes, it's a way to take a string and a variant and create a lookup table so that you can have you know, your, all your strings and all your variants and then say, hey, give me the variant that's assigned to this string value. It's a way to create a lookup table in LabVIEW before we actually had lookup tables in LabVIEW. But the problem is, is your key always had to be a string and your value always had to be a variant. And anytime you had to do uh, conversions between data types, it would end up causing performance issues. Now, the thing about variant attributes is that uh, people used them as a data storage mechanism in LabVIEW for so many years that LabVIEW R&D optimized the heck out of them. And they optimized them so much that there are a few small use cases where the old hacky way of using variant attributes to look up data is actually a little bit faster, tiny bit faster than the legit way of looking up data with a map. But that's pretty rare. If you find yourself in your code and you're looking up something, if you say, oh, I've, I need to look up what this value is, if that's the sort of the mental model that you have. In older approaches to LabVIEW, you were probably using things like Search1D Array to do a lookup or Build Array to, to build up a, a you know, collection of data in an array. You might wanna ask yourself if you should use a set or a map instead, because those might end up being more performant, especially for lookups. I have a presentation all about this topic, by the way. Uh, it's called All About Collection Data Types. It's on dnat.org that I mentioned before, and the specific page is bit.ly slash dnat collections. So if you wanna learn more about sets and maps in LabVIEW and how you can use them to do more efficient data lookups, you can watch that presentation. All right, y'all had to suffer through all of that. Now let's get to the actual real world demos. I'm gonna put my clicker down over here because I'll be programming in LabVIEW. Are there any questions before I switch over to LabVIEW? Okay, so every one of these, th oh, there is a question, I'm sorry, I missed it. What you got? Is there any reason why you shouldn't inline VIs? There's, <laughs> you should have mentioned you couldn't look at it in the VI profiler, but is there, a, is there a negative to it other than that? Right, so the question is, is there a reason that you should not inline VIs? Remember I mentioned that you'll typically wanna find small VIs that are running a whole bunch of times. Anytime you inline a VI, that VI's content gets, on the compiler side, not, not anything that you see, but on the compiler side, that VI's content gets sucked into its owning VI's diagram. If you inline everything, you've got one VI that has everything on its block diagram as, as far as the compiler is concerned. Compiled code complexity can cause your editor to slow down. And frankly, it can cause issues with execution, if I'm being honest as well. So you wanna be a, a little bit more surgical about which times that you say, eh, it's okay for LabVIEW to pull this VI's diagram into its caller. Because if you just do that to everything, I've seen applications where the entire editor ground to a halt. Because LabVIEW, one of the great things about LabVIEW is that it's always compiling your code. That's why you always know you have a broken run arrow or a regular run arrow. Well, imagine a situation where your entire application is one block diagram that LabVIEW has to compile. That, that's, that's untenable. So we wanna make sure to focus our inlining efforts on the sub-VIs that are small, that when they're pulled into their calling VIs diagram, don't add a lot of complexity to the code. All right, thank you for that question. All right, our first real world demo is this application here. So the DAC team at NI came to me with a performance issue. They had a folder full of giant TDMS files and they had written a VI that would convert those TDMS files into comma separated value files and their VI took forever to run. So they came to me and they said, can you help us figure out how to speed up this code that is converting these TDMS files, the, the waveforms in them to CSV files. So I said, sure. 
So they gave me the VI. The one that I'm showing here uh, is a, a small subset. Uh, so if we look at the block diagram, we will see that there is this uh, waveform array here that uh, will pretend that this was the array of all the waveforms from their TDMS files that they were loading. In my case, uh, it is much smaller because I don't want y'all to have to sit through the minutes that it took for their code to run. But right now we'll run this and we can see it takes a little bit of time. And so what you see on this block diagram is effectively the issue, the, the, the slow code that they had. So I said, all right, well, what's the first thing I learned from Darren's presentation? Technically I had not written this presentation yet, but uh, I had used a lot of these tools. And so I said, well, let's run the profiler. So tools, profile, performance, and memory. This is the procedure that I told you guys earlier on in the presentation. Run it, check timing statistics, click start, run the VI, click snapshot, and this is completely worthless because all it tells us is that we had one VI that ran in 700 milliseconds. So this is not helpful. All I know is my VI and how long it took. Well, that, that gives me no information, right? Well, if I look at this log diagram a little bit more, I do see a sub VI. So I'll zoom in for you. So the fact that this did not show up in the profiler tells me that that sub VI is marked as inline. So I can't get its information. So I could go in and I could change that sub VI to non inline, but instead what I'm gonna do is my silly trick that I told you guys before. I am going to pick a chunk of code and turn it into a sub VI. I'm gonna pick another chunk of code and turn it into a sub VI. And I'm gonna pick another chunk of code and turn it into a sub VI. Now the last one here, when I first saw the code, I thought this was gonna be the bottleneck. I thought the write to text file function was gonna be what was slow. That was my intuition. You're about to find out that my intuition was wrong. So now we have three sub VIs. Now we're gonna stop the profiler. We're gonna start it again. And if we look in the list, we see, oh look, there's those sub VIs that I just created. And there's another one in the list later. So we are gonna click run. We are gonna click snapshot. And now we have more information. Now, instead of one VI showing up in the list, we have four VIs showing up in the list. Well, my intuition was wrong. The sub VI that's doing the file IO is actually the fastest piece of code out of everything that I just looked at. And, oh, I guess I'll stay zoomed in here. And it looks like the second sub VI I created also doesn't take very long, but the first sub VI I created takes a lot of time. So the code that we are concerned about optimizing, if I get rid of these sub VIs with some undos, the code that we are interested in optimizing is this right here. So a couple of things, none of these for loops are parallel. So that seems like an easy thing that we might be able to speed up. And um, again, we've got nested for loops. Uh, remember I said before, you typically wanna make the outer for loop parallel. And then that sub VI there, if we go look at that, I um, think we're gonna find nothing too interesting. Yeah, so there's nothing really much to optimize here. We're just uh, converting to a, a string. I asked the DAC team, uh, hey, instead of using timestamps in your CSVs, can we just do zero, one, two, three, four, five? Because that'd make things faster. They're like, no, we want timestamps. So have to keep the timestamp. So let me show you guys what the optimized code. Uh, first of all, I'll run the optimized code and you'll see that I was able to make the code uh, five times faster. So that's pretty cool. And what I did was I consolidated. So there were four loops nested in four loops and then four loops being called after that. You can see now we got one for loop that's got, uh, and it's also marked as parallel. So this is a parallel for loop. And I made a sub VI. And inside of that, it turns out I'm breaking my own rule that I told you guys, which is uh, I have a nested parallel for loop inside another parallel for loop. Turns out it ran a tiny bit faster when I parallelized that inside one. Usually that's not the case. Usually you only want to parallelize the outside one. But ultimately, I managed to get about 80% of the speed improvement was from the parallelization, uh, marking VIs as inline, consolidating the loops, and then uh, the, <laughs> the simplification of timestamp string generation. So um, this is a presentation I first gave six years ago. When I first gave this presentation, the diagram of uh, this, the one that we saw in the original code, uh, actually, this is a VI lib VI. This code actually was more complicated and uh, in the time between when I first gave this presentation and now uh, live R&D actually fixed this VI to make it work like I did in my presentation, which I gave six years ago. So it's kind of cool when I can make live a little bit better. All right, so that was our demonstration of how to use the VI profiler. Hopefully I really showed you guys that it's not that bad. You, and again, I will, I will demonstrate it one more time to just show how easy it is. 
uh, you open your VI, you run tools, profile, performance and memory, you click start, you click run, you click snapshot, and you interpret the results. And at this point, this is where we would use my silly trick to make subvi to get more information. But usually, you're not gonna have to use that silly trick because hopefully when you've got your performance issues, you've got modular code and you can identify subvi to track down performance issues in. All right, so moving on to my next demo. So this was another team at NI who had a pretty, it was a peculiar data lookup situation. So this is a team who had a collection of complex numbers, so real and imaginary, like, you know, back from math class. They had a collection of complex numbers, and for every one of those complex numbers, they had an index into some database entry that they wanted to look into. So if we think in terms of key value pairs, the key is the complex number, and the value is an integer. So they had some code that was doing lookups, and we're talking about a huge collection of complex numbers and a huge collection of indices. Again, for the purposes of the demo, I've, I've made it a little bit smaller. But they're doing some lookups, and their lookup time was in the you know, 500 microsecond range. And the way their code worked was, uh, this is sort of me simulating their complex numbers that they were using, and this is me simulating their indices that they were using. But ultimately what it came down to was, once it was time to do the lookups, uh, again, the key is a complex number and the value is an integer. They would do a search 1D array to look into this array of keys that they had, which is the complex numbers. And then when they, they found the one they wanted, they would index out of the uh, integer array to find the value. So this is what they were doing. They wanted to speed this code up. So that team had heard about variant attributes. So they had heard that variant attributes were a really good way to do data lookups in LabVIEW. So they changed their code over to do variant attributes and to show you what that code looks like. Uh, for variant attributes, and again, I'm not gonna get into details in this, I talk about it in my collections presentation. Their key is the complex number, which they are converting into string, because you have to do that for variant lookups. And the value is their integer. And then once they have created their lookups, they come in here, they take their complex number, they turn it into a string, and then with the variant functions, they go do look, the lookup to find the right index. So the, they changed their code over to this approach. And when they ran their code, they got super frustrated because it turned out that the variant lookups were way slower. And if you remember from my slides earlier, I said that your variant key has to be a string. Well, their variant key is a complex number, remember? So in their code, they're converting the complex number into a string to do the lookup. And that's completely killing their performance. The actual lookup itself is fast. The conversion of a complex number to a string is very slow. And so when they came to me with this, they were like, hey, we thought variant attributes were better. What's the deal? I said, well, you know, that's, that's the problem. And this team was working in a version of LabVIEW after 2019. So I said, why don't we do a map? So if you've never seen maps before in LabVIEW, this is a for loop that is building up a map of key value pairs where the key is the complex number and the value is the integer. And you can see the key, which is the complex number, does not have to be converted into a string or anything. And then if we go look at the actual lookup, we see that the lookup, you simply pass in the complex number and you give back the integer. So no conversion required. And whenever we use a map instead of the variant attributes, we find that the lookups are incredibly fast compared to not only the crappy way of doing the variant attributes, but even the search 1D array were way faster than that. So if you need fast lookups in your code and you have not looked at maps in LabVIEW before and you're using LabVIEW 2019 or later, definitely look into learning more about maps. And I've really had to train myself after, you know, two and a half decades of LabVIEW programming and really having patterns in my head about how to deal with collections of data, <clears throat> uh, building up arrays and loops, search 1D array. I'm having to retrain myself that there's a lot of times where when I would have used to have used an array, I should be using a map or a set now. All right, so let's go into the last demo. This is another real world example. <clears throat> this is a team who had an array of class values that represented some database information and they wanted to export that array to a table. You can see in the slide here, we've got over 15,000 values in that array. I'm gonna run the VI, then I'm gonna go to the block diagram because it's gonna take a little bit to run. 
So this is how the team was converting the class data into a table. First, they were, it looks like they were sorting that information. So if we zoom in, we'll see that we're uh, you know, collecting the class data in a way that it can be sorted. And then in the main loop of the code, we're coming in, we are reading several things out of a class property node. Remember I mentioned sometimes reading class data in a tight loop can be slow. Uh, then it looks like we're doing some sort of um, generation of a table here. I see here that we're generating the same array every single time. Uh, the LiveView compiler is probably going to do what's called constant folding to that, to turn that into a calculated value that it uses. So this probably isn't a performance issue, but my eye did catch on to it. And then uh, let's see, we are using the uh, a JSON primitive to unflatten from a JSON string. Remember I mentioned sometimes that JSON functions can be a little bit slower than native string functions. And then the most egregious thing I see is, uh, this right here. So we have an array of table data. We are deleting a row out of that 2D array. We are making a change to the values in that row, and then we are re-adding that row to the 2D array. This pattern is terrible. Do not do this. Do not take an array, delete, change, re-add. Just replace the thing in that spot in the array. Do not do this pattern. That was the biggest red flag to me when I saw this code. And one other thing I'll mention, I don't think I mentioned it before, we have two for loops and neither of them are parallel. So those are the kinds of things that I look for when I'm trying to optimize code. So if we close this and look at the front panel, this VI took nine and a half seconds to run. And after I optimized it, it took one and a half seconds to run. And some of the things that I did, the vast majority of my speed improvement was this right here. So, uh oh, I guess I'll zoom in. So now instead of delete, change, re-add, I'm doing a replace array subset where I find the spot in the array where I wanna replace something. So there's no delete, there's no re-add. That was the primary way I sped this code up. Another way that I sped this code up was that I did some pre-processing. So remember I mentioned that parallel for loops can't be parallel if they have shift registers on them. Well, we see over here that there are a couple of feedback nodes, which is effectively a shift register. So this code can't be parallelized because one iteration depends on the previous iteration. But what I figured out was I figured out how much of the stuff that this loop is doing can I pre-process and do before we get into this loop? And that was the creation of this loop up here. So this loop up here is parallel uh, because it has no data dependency between iterations. You can see that I replaced the JSON functions with string primitives. This code is incredibly brittle. If the JSON format ever changes, this will break like nobody's business. But if my goal was performance, there are sometimes things that you have to do to make your code eke out that little bit of performance. That is not something I would do in a regular application. But if our goal was to get the fastest possible performance, sometimes we have to do silly things like do string primitive functionality on a string, on a JSON string instead of just using the JSON primitives. Another thing that you'll notice I did, the loop on the right has no class information in it because I did all of the pre-processing of the class data in the loop on the left, which is parallel. So I don't have to do any processing of the class in the tight loop. So those are some examples of some things that I've done in real world applications to speed up VIs based on some of the techniques in this presentation. Are there any questions about any of the stuff that I just demoed? Anything else y'all wanna see in LiveView? That is all I had, you guys. So thank you for coming. Uh, you can download my slides. Let's make our VIs faster, bit.ly slash slow VIs. Thanks a lot.